Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul, and in this RedGamingTech.com video, we're going to be discussing, as well as analysing, tech news, which, as usual, has popped up in the past 24 or so hours. I hope you all are having an amazing day. We have an awful lot of stuff to get through in this video, but the first thing I'd really like to begin with concerns AMD and their upcoming GPUs for 2020. And this is pertinent to not only PC gaming, but also some stuff relates to the consoles as well. Lisa Su, during the recent earnings call, was asked what we can expect for GPUs in the 2020 timeframe, both for the server market as well as for desktop. And Lisa responds, in 2019, we launched our new architecture in GPUs. It's the RDNA architecture, and those were Navi-based products. You should expect those will be refreshed in 2020, and when we'll have a next generation of RDNA architecture that will be part of the 2020 lineup. So that word, refreshed, immediately caught people's eye, because it's kind of like you're saying refreshed, but you're also saying next generation of RDNA. So what does that mean? Does that mean that RDNA 2 is only an iterative step? I guess the most obvious example would be like Zen to Zen Plus. It's not that Zen Plus, which was the Ryzen 2000 series, didn't have improvements. It was a modest clock frequency increase, plus a little bit of uh, improvement on IPC, particularly with latency on the caches. But if you had, just for example, an 1800X or a 1600X, you probably weren't going to be that tempted to jump to a 2600X, for example. But you have to take into consideration that refresh, in this case, was used to address a financial earnings report. And refresh does not mean what we in the tech industry think it means. Um, so Lisa actually, uh, sorry, AMD, excuse me, clarified the statement and said that no, she did not mean that there's going to be an iterative improvement. So for example, an RX 5750, instead it would be an entirely new set of products. And AMD clarified that this would be to the high-end GPU market. So these are going to be high-end Navi, big Navi, whatever you want to call it. Furthermore, she also clarified that on the 5th of March, which isn't too long into the future, just a little bit over a month now, we would learn further details of these upcoming graphics cards. And to add to that, for the data center, we will learn more about the data center GPUs in the second half of 2020. And that, of course, means Arcturus. I have some information regarding Arcturus that I want to share with you all. However, I want to put that together in a proper video and uh, kind of walk you all through it. So that's going to be an exclusive that I'll probably put out in the next few days. So if you are interested in learning a little bit more about AMD's data center plans, then, of course, you can check that video out. So all of this information, basically, with the high-end GPUs, tallies up very nicely with my own leaks. Um, I'm hearing that the second generation of cards will go up to 80 compute units, and that has seemingly been confirmed, and I'll put it in such a term, because obviously this stuff uh, could turn out to be completely wrong, by multiple other sources. Um, furthermore, these cards are going to be considerably more efficient I was told by one source that power efficiency is going to be a big thing for the next generation, and that's one of the reasons that some of the team that were working on the efficiency of Zen have now moved on to the uh, RTG group, Radeon Technologies group, and I did cover this quite extensively in a different video. That was an exclusive. I'll try to remember to link that in the description of this video, but either way, AMD basically have confirmed that they are looking to shake up 4K graphics. What's interesting, though, is that Lisa is not saying this without acknowledging, I suppose is the best way of putting it, that NVIDIA, as well as Intel, are going to be offering a lot of resistance over the next 12 months. NVIDIA in particular are the dark horse here. We don't really know that much regarding RTX 30. Many are still calling it Ampere, but it could be called something entirely different, for example, Hopper. No one really knows that much about it. From what I'm hearing through the grapevine, one of the big changes with, I'm just going to call it Ampere because it's faster than saying RTX 30, one of the big changes with Ampere is that we see a drastically more efficient ray tracing method 
but quite how that's achieved, whether it's pure brute force method, in other words, just adding more ray tracing cores per SM, or whether it's just because they have more SMs which are running at a higher clock frequency, or whether it's a combination of that plus the ray tracing uh, cores doing more work, no one's exactly certain. I do believe, however, that the RTX 30 series of cards is going to be pretty impressive, because you have to remember that Turing is using 12 nm. So, Turing is already an incredibly efficient architecture. I think that AMD, though, do have an awful lot of talented individuals, so to me it's going to be really fascinating to see how all of this comes together. I'm just really hoping that the launch is smoother than, let's say, the RX 5600 XT, which was a kind of a bit of a mess. Also, we do know that the second generation of RDNA is going to be using TSMC's 7nm Plus process, and looking at the slightly updated roadmap, Radeon Gaming Architecture, Continuous Performance, Innovation, and Efficiency Gains. Of course, this does also tie up nicely with what one of my sources said regarding efficiency improvements, which honestly, Narve could still stand to become more energy efficient, although comparing it to GCN, there is some obviously tangible increase in performance there. So yeah, I'm really looking forward to seeing what AMD and NVIDIA both bring to the table, particularly in light of the next generation consoles not being too long into the future. Honestly, I think that if we see graphics cards over the next 12 months not increase uh, performance dramatically, but also charge very much the same price, it's going to definitely push a lot of people to move towards console gaming for the next one to two years, which is one of the reasons I do think, although I could be totally wrong, that NVIDIA and AMD will both do their darndest to reduce the price as much as possible in the mid-range, hopefully. But, as always, watch this space. Speaking, however, of next-generation consoles, I'd like to discuss an interview with Phil Spencer, where he was actually bluntly honest concerning the CPU performance in the current generation. Bear in mind, both the PlayStation 4 as well as the Xbox One use variants of the AMD Jaguar processor, albeit clocked at different frequencies depending upon the console. The PS4 base model runs at 1600MHz, the Xbox One 1750MHz, and the fastest console is the Xbox One X at 2300MHz. There are also a few tweaks on the hardware itself, like with Xbox, we see some uh, CPU cycles saved because DX12 uh, commands are somewhat baked into the silicon, but in general, the CPU is definitely the weakest part of the machine, and you could say that it's kind of top-heavy towards the GPU. This was also something that developers kind of hinted early on as well, which is one of the reasons that uh, Sony in particular pushed a lot of stuff towards asynchronous compute. Anyway... Phil discusses this and said that we've never really tried to limit what developers are trying to do on our platform, whether it's 60 FPS on the Xbox 360 or people doing 4K 60 FPS on the Xbox One X. I will add that that's not exactly a large portion of games which would be able to achieve that, but anyway, continue Phil. We want to give developers the tools to try things that they want to try on any hardware platforms and capability to be there for them to go try things. I think we've reached a point on the Xbox One X in the generation where the games look amazing, and there was work to do to get them to look even more amazing, but I want games to feel as amazing as they look, and we just don't have that in today's generation, mainly because the CPU is underpowered relative to the GPU inside the box in order to reach what I feel and frame rate and kind of consistency or variable rate refresh and other things that we want. As for looking at the future, the feel of games was definitely something you wanted to have more focus on, not just throwing more pixels up onto the screen. The reduction in latency for controller input is also another thing that Microsoft are working on for the Xbox as well. I'm going to be very curious to see how all of this comes together. After all, the um, next generation console APU has been shown off and it has 8K emblazoned upon it. So I don't think we're going to be seeing a whole bunch of games running at 8K at 120 FPS for the sake of argument. But, clearly Microsoft are wanting to give developers the choice, much like Sony as well, 
Sony also want to push towards higher frame rates for their games, which is one of the reasons that both console manufacturers have been a lot less, uh, let's use the word restrained when it comes to their decision for the CPU. Although, in fairness, there was also considerably less options for when the uh, Xbox One and the PlayStation 4 launched as well. In terms of like a power efficient processor, AMD had not even slightly gone close to launching Zen at the time. So, yeah, I'm going to be really interested to see what all of this comes together as, and also what's going to happen in terms of sparing people to make purchase decisions for the televisions as well. Clearly, higher refresh rate televisions are becoming the norm, particularly at lower resolutions, like, for example, 1440p. There's also a whole bunch of reasonably priced monitors which fit that bill as well. So I will be interested to see exactly how this affects gaming and also people's uh, habits and purchase decisions over the next couple of years. I do think now that people are a lot wiser when it comes to the impact that frame rate makes in games. And when both next generation, or rather previous generation consoles launched, the Xbox One and PlayStation 4, a lot of developers were pushing this narrative of 30 FPS being more cinematic and, of course, that was a load of crap. Um, it wasn't more cinematic, and it did not make for a better gaming experience. It was purely for performance decisions. And I'm very thankful now that developers are, in a lot of titles for the PlayStation 4 Pro and Xbox One X, putting in an option where you can play at a higher frame rate, albeit at a lower resolution, or you can choose the higher visual quality, but at a lower frame rate. I think it's good to give consumers the option. And the final thing I'd like to discuss today actually does not pertain to news exactly. Instead, it's a small update to yesterday's video. Um, so if you haven't watched yesterday's video, please do so if you're curious about next generation console stuff. However, a couple of people DM'd me and also a couple of people uh, emailed me. And thanks very much for people who are interacting with me. It's, well, extremely appreciated. Uh, I got a lot of uh, positive uh, reception for yesterday's video. But a couple of people pointed out that I did miss a couple of things. So one of those things I missed was that Kamachi himself, um, late last year, it was uh, late December did tweet a updated set of code names for GPUs. And one of the things I forgot to mention uh, in yesterday's video is that there has been an updated variant of the Arial, aka essentially PlayStation 5 Silicon, which is B0. So this is obviously getting closer now to final production. I forgot to mention that yesterday, but what it basically means is that, according to Kamachi anyway, he doesn't believe the specifications have changed, it's just getting closer to the final production silicon. The other thing that um, I forgot to mention is that we have seen an absolute smorgasbord of what claims to be accurate information on the likes of Pastebin for the PlayStation 5 and so on, uh, in terms of their specifications, I did throw a couple of examples of those on screen yesterday, but I didn't really spend that much time discussing them. One of the things that we are seeing is a claim that the uh, PlayStation 5 will be running with additional compute units rather than the 36. So basically there are 40 compute units on the GPU. However, some of those are disabled for yields. Now this is an example. I'm not saying that yields do work like this because I know someone in the comments is going to correct me. I'm just giving an example. But let's say that you produce 100 GPUs. Um, and if you are looking to have, let's say, 40 out of 40 compute units, you might have, oh, I don't know, 80 of those, gra of those GPUs which match that criteria. In other words, there will be some which have defective GPUs. So then, if you were to say, well, no, my target is let's say 38 compute units out of 40, then obviously the number of dies which would be eligible for that criteria increases and so on and so on. There are other factors as well, not least of which includes clock frequency targets. But one thing that I have seen is that Sony are going to increase the potential number of compute units that way. And so we could see up to 40 compute units. Now I had considered adding that yesterday, 
but quite frankly the video had already gotten pretty lengthy. So there are some paste bin leaks like the one that's on screen right now. One of the issues I have with that particular paste bin leak though is it does mention a, um, a secondary uh, chip which handles the ray tracing calculations and I'm not particularly sure that that's the case. To my knowledge the PlayStation 5 has a hybrid design between the first generation of RDNA and the second generation of RDNA. Um, this seems to be backed up with internal testing documents, plus a couple of other people have told me the same thing. So I believe that the PlayStation 5, as well as the Xbox, handle calculations via the GPU. Personally, I've been told by bits and chips on Twitter that the Xbox has a slight advantage in the ray tracing performance. Now, I don't know whether that's because it has a slightly more advanced version of the GPU, or whether that is a load of rubbish, or whether it's for a totally different reason. Uh, that has not been made clear to bits and chips, unless myself. But in retrospect, I probably should have put that information in yesterday's video. So yeah, I just wanted to add that in here, just so that we're all on the same page. With that said though, I am going to let you all go. There are a couple of interesting projects that I've been working on. Um, so if you want, if you don't want to hear about this, you can close out the video. But basically a couple of projects I'm working on. The ray tracing stuff for the next generation consoles. I had actually finished the script for it. But I decided to be a glutton for punishment and expand my uh, reach for it. So that's one of the reasons that I contacted a couple of different AIBs. So both Zotac and MSI have sent over um, RTX 20 series of cards, both a 2060 Super and 2070 Super for this project. So that's being expanded. I'm also uh, working on an Is Intel Screwed, let's say, on the desktop. So I've got an awful lot of information from uh, several sources regarding Intel's future CPU stuff. And that's going to be with some fresh uh, AMD CPU stuff so I'm kind of working on that script it's almost written it's over 3,000 words now so I'm going to probably finish that off um, tomorrow while I'm reviewing an uh, AMD RX 5500 XT I've done all the photography for that and there's some other bits and bobs that I'm working on as well which do pertain to the next generation consoles um, and most of this is going to come down to how the um, cross-generation I suppose support for the Xbox One and uh, Xbox Series X are going to kind of impact one another so those are some extra things that I'm working on but anyway I'm just letting you know what's going on behind the scenes and uh, hopefully you will stick with me anyway thank you very much once again for your time and for subscribing if you're a new subscriber or if you're a long-time subscriber thank you as well with all that said, take care of yourself, have an amazing day, and bye for now.